So can we talk about the object though? Like, I mean, the gold object and like what happened? So I know about as much as everybody else at this point, I think. When we came across it, it immediately caught our eye just because of how shiny it was and, and it was gold. So colors in the deep sea are interesting. There is no light, so why have that color? And I immediately was like, oh, this is some interesting sort of sponge. Let's take a closer look. And as we got closer, I was like, it looks a little less spongy to me. But the interesting thing about this object in particular, I think, is that it got so much publicity and kind of got international news. And nobody's come forward and saying like, ooh, yes, I know what this is. I've studied it. You're going down and you're mapping the ocean floor. Is that really, how would we describe it? Yeah. So with our our suite of sonars, we we're doing a number of things at the same time. So kind of the bread and butter of what we're doing is our multi-beam bathymetry. So that's using a sonar to make those 3D models of the seafloor. And through that, we can kind of see, okay, if this is what the texture of the seafloor is, we think maybe these habitats are there. And then we're able to send the vehicle down and either prove or disprove that. But at the same time, we're also looking at the water column. So we have other sonars that are focused in different layers of the water column that can see things that aren't water, right? So whether that's bubbles that are coming up from the seafloor from seeps, or if that's biological things in the water column, we can get kind of an idea of what's there too. And then we have a sub-bottom profiler, which looks beneath the seafloor. So it can see some of the layering of the rock or the sediment down there. So we're kind of, as we're going, trying to get a complete picture from where the ship is to beneath the seafloor of what we can see what's down there. You know, what does the remote vehicle do? It has video, it has what other kind of tools are on top of that? And there's nobody in it, right? No, there's nobody in it. So it's remotely operated. So it's basically like a a very fancy video game. I'm sure that my ROV pilots would balk at me saying that. But (laughs) The way we saw the video kind of looked like a video. I mean, the way you were all talking about getting the object, I have to say. It is. There there are some definite similarities to to carnival games and (laughs) and vacuuming. Um, But the vehicle, it's a lot bigger than I think I imagined it being. And it's part of a two-body system. So we have one that's kind of down there. And I think of it like a person walking a dog. So Deep Discoverer is the main primary vehicle, and that has a number of cameras, I think at least 15 on it, as well as sensors to take conductivity, temperature, and depth, which that's kind of used ubiquitously throughout science, those measurements, as well as like oxygen reduction potential, turbidity, all kinds of things. And it's actually all custom built. So we're able to put things on or off it, depending on what the mission calls for. Also, it has a number of ways to sample. So it has two grabber arms on it, which that's kind of like the claw machine from a carnival. It's a little bit more sophisticated than that. And also a suction hose. So we can actually grab the suction and that's for softer body things or collecting soft sediment. So kind of the rest of the vehicle is made to support those two things, getting that high definition video where you can get a lot of information from. And then the the sampling tools where if the visual analysis isn't enough, like in the case of this object, we're able to bring it back on board and take a closer look and then send it to the National Museum of Natural History in DC, where scientists can take even deeper looks at it. Where were you when you found this object? We were on the Kodiak Bowie Seamount chain. So it's a seamount chain that runs basically from the Aleutian Trench just south of Kodiak all the way to Haida Gwaii off of Canada. And we're about halfway down that chain, probably 200 miles off of the coast of Alaska. I mean, you're looking through the cameras and then you spot something. And then I think the story of what did you see looks like, I mean, you know, beautiful. What happened? Yeah. So one of the really cool things about the way that we operate is that we have people, the the public and scientists around the world watching in real time. So everything that we do is live streamed. And that is what makes everything that we do possible because we can have 49 people aboard the ship. And that's inclusive of the ship's crew that keep everything running, keep everybody fed and keep us safe, as well as the scientific party, which includes the people that are doing our data systems, the people that are piloting the RVs, the mapping technicians, 
And then we generally have a biological and a geological science lead. And they generally serve as a master of ceremonies of type where they can take in input in real time from the scientific community and then relay that to the pilots. So that's generally what we're doing is we're walking around or walking, we're cruising around the seafloor looking at things. And then if we see something interesting or if somebody that's watching sees something interesting, they can either call in in real time or we have a little chat room, like old school <laughs> chat room where the scientists are all kind of discussing things in real time. So then we'd have people in Japan saying like, hey, this is a coral species that we've never seen before. Can we get a closer look? And then we'll get a closer look at it and be like, this is something that's super interesting. Let's take a sample. And kind of throughout each of our expeditions, we'll have an idea of the things that people are interested in and, and what we are interested in. But then also taking that input from everybody ashore kind of allows us to, to broaden our expertise in the moment. So this day, this is just a scheduled dive. There's nothing particularly special that's brought you there. You're just going down to take a look around? Kind of. We generally, before every expedition takes off months before, we'll get a bunch of input from the scientific community about the things that we should target in a region. We basically say, hey, we're coming with these assets. What, what do you want? which I think is a really cool way to do science. And it's different than a lot of the ways that other things operate. It gives us a lot of more flexibility. Where I say that what we're doing is generating hypotheses rather than proving it. We're just going out there and saying like, whoa, that's cool. What do you think? So we do talk to the scientific community beforehand and pick out sites, especially in the Gulf of Alaska, especially at this time of year, it can be a fairly volatile place weather-wise. So during the planning stages, I wanted to know a little bit more of like what general depth ranges and what types of features should we be looking for? And then that makes it easier to run from storms and pick different places that you can work in. So this particular site was one, we were working along the seamount chains, and this was a smaller volcanic dome that was separate from the seamounts that the geologists aboard, Jamie Conrad, who's from the, the United States Geological Survey, had the idea that it probably wasn't directly related to the formation of the other seamounts. Like it may have been a different age, may have been a different type of formation. And it's one at a depth range about 3,300 meters, which I think is close to two miles. At that depth range, there's very little known. So it's a biological interest as well, because it's like, who knows what's down there? So it wasn't random that we selected it, but it, it came kind of under those. So there's 49 people on the ship. How many are required to run this vehicle and the cameras and everything else? Is it everybody? You know, how big is the team that's going to operate this thing? Yeah, that's a, a question that you can answer a couple different ways. Because Technically, it does take everybody to make it work, right? Because we need to be fed. We need to make sure that the engines are running, all of this and that. So there's really not any extra space on board or extra people. But to physically run the vehicle in real time, generally, so we have a control room. That's where everybody's sitting to kind of control and, and narrate the dives. And in the front row, there'll be the navigator who's kind of looking at the geospatial data and the currents and, and kind of directing where the pilot should be looking. There's a main pilot who's piloting the primary ROV, Deep Discoverer. There's a co-pilot who's piloting the secondary ROV or Sirius. So those three are kind of directly affecting it. Then there's a video engineer who's working on focusing the camera and doing pans and tilts and zooming in, zooming out. And those are the ones that are directly kind of adjusting things in real time. And then in the back row, it'll be either me or a mapping technician sitting, kind of helping with things. The two science leads that are narrating and taking in all that information and then another video engineer who is clipping things in real time because they make these amazing highlight videos after every single dive the night of, which is kind of insane to me um, to have these like, professionally produced things. It's not in the room at the time. Does the room have windows or is the oh, room okay. pitch room is pitch black? So it's like a NASA kind of equivalent of thing like when we see people sending things into orbit kind of thing. Exactly. And there are actually a lot of parallels between space exploration and ocean exploration. But the, the rooms, I wouldn't say it's pitch black because I think there's upwards of 40 computer screens in there that are all showing mm -hmm. one thing or another, but it's all painted black and it, it's very reminiscent of like a NASA control room. But even on one of our dives this expedition, we were looking for a cruise ship that sank in 1980 that it's one of the greatest Coast Guard rescue stories of all time. So I think there were 524 people aboard 
and they were all rescued in October in the Gulf of Alaska in 1980 with no injuries, no serious injuries, which is wow. incredibly incredible. impressive. So one of the pilots of the first helicopter in the rescue mission was the Coast Guard's first astronaut who was on the Endeavour space flight. And he actually called in while we were looking and was saying how just watching the videos and, and the stuff that we're doing reminded him of being in space. So it wow. is a direct parallel in that regard. Yeah. So this is one of the big, well, maybe the biggest difference with satellites and things going up is that you're looking at life under the sea. So how often is it when you're doing these explorations, do you see a jumbo uh, octopus or a you know a giant squid or something? You know, How often do you run into something you've never seen before? Pretty much every dive, we'll see something either that we didn't expect to be there. So we look a lot for range extensions. Either it's like, oh, I didn't know that thing lived this deep, or this is way too far north to see that. As well as new species, we find new or unidentified species all the time. It's, it's kind of like shocking. The way that I like to put it, because I've been thinking about this a lot, is pretty much every dive that we're doing, we go about 400 meters. If we're not getting distracted, maybe we can go a little bit further, but we're often distracted. There's a lot to look at. But if you think about that, we're just picking one small, I think of it like walking down a city street. So you're walking down one block in a city, looking around and saying, okay, I know what the world is now because I've seen this one city block. But if that block's in Times Square and then you're dropped in Yellowstone National Park and you see a tree and you're like, I have no idea what this thing is. That's basically what we're doing. So a lot of people are asking like, oh, this is so unusual. And my thought with that is, how do we know if that's unusual if we have no idea what usual is? So we're just trying to get that baseline every time we go down there, which is why we see new things every dive. You know, we haven't explored very much of the ocean, yeah? No, we haven't. Even just with those high quality maps. So we have a general, very low resolution idea of the oceans that we can get through satellites, but that's low resolution. Our high resolution mapping is especially in Alaskan waters. And one of the reasons that we were up there, two thirds of Alaskan waters are just unknown almost entirely. And then if you whittled that down further to actually getting eyes on the seafloor, that percentage goes way, way down. So I would say the vast majority of the oceans are, if not completely unexplored, highly underexplored. You're down there. And what's it like down in this particular area before you find this object? I mean, is there anything unusual before you find this object? I would say, so the, the funny thing about this object is we saw it, came across it, picked it up, and then I think promptly forgot about it. Um, and that's not because it wasn't interesting or, or cool. It's just, that's kind of the way that we operate. We're always seeing interesting things. We'll be like, oh yeah, we'll see this later. The highlight video that night that was produced was not about this object. <laughs> I believe that one was about octopus changing colors. It was really interesting. So I would say it was a normal dive in the way that each dive is kind of its own thing. But mm -hmm. at those depths, you do see some more interesting things. Like we came across some carnivorous sponges, which I always think is really cool. Um, wait, what, wait, wait, what's a carnivorous sponge? <laughs> yeah, so there's... and. Some of the taxonomists might blame me for this, but I think it's the family Clatterizidae. And the Clatterizid sponges, they're carnivorous. They often look very Dr. Seussy, um, where they have like big bulbs on the end of spines. Really, really interesting looking, very otherworldly, but they derive most of their energy from eating other things. So they'll, they'll trap things and, and eat them. That's one of the coolest things about the deep sea to me is you see all of these adaptations to living in such a weird, for lack of a better term, space where it's cold, there's a lot of pressure, there's often not a lot of influence of the outside world. So you get some marine snow down there, but you see adaptations of the way that things live and the way that things eat. And it often is very strange to what we're used to. How dark is it? It's really dark, right? It is perfectly dark. Yeah. So when you're walking around, then what kind of light sources are you using? We have a number of, I believe, on the front of the vehicle, it's either 18 or 24 lights that have, I believe, 10,000 lumens a piece. So very, very bright lights. So we're kind of bringing our own sun down there with us. Yeah. And with that, one of the main things that our video engineers will work on as soon as we get to the bottom is making sure that the colors that we're seeing are true to life. So we have a basically a color card on one of the arms that it looks down and it makes it so you're not getting that 
attenuated or, or weird kind of bluish type look where you see if you're taking video scuba diving and you don't correct it. So it's color corrected to true to life. And a lot of times we're putting the first light on these areas that there's ever been. Does the light ever change the behavior of the animals or do, are we not sure? It's hard to tell um, because without it, we wouldn't be able to see the animals at all. I assume so. I think one of the more interesting versions of that are whenever we get giant squid or any kind of squid species that are more the visual hunters, they get attracted to the lights often. So we'll have that. We had a, a number of sable fish on one of our dives that were just following us around. And everywhere you'd look, it would just be another sable fish. But there was one instance in particular that I can think of that we had a squid that attached itself to the light bar and was just hanging on. And we weren't sure how we were going to get rid of it. But <laughs> the thought is that it was attracted to the temperature and it just was on there warming its belly. Oh my gosh. So can we talk about the object though? Like, I mean, the gold object and like what happened? <laughs> so I know about as much as everybody else at this point, I think. So as far as like when we came across it, I think I was the one on the mic at first. It immediately caught our eye just because of how shiny it was and, and it was gold. So colors in the deep sea are interesting. There is no light. So why have that color? But that one caught our eye and I immediately was like, oh, this is some interesting sort of sponge. Let's take a closer look. And as we got closer, I was like, it looks a little less spongy to me. And then talking to the scientists in the chat, there were a couple different ideas, maybe a coral, maybe a some sort of egg case. And that's kind of where I'm leaning now, especially after getting it on board and seeing it a little more. But the interesting thing about this object in particular, I think, is that it got so much publicity and kind of got international news. And nobody's come forward and saying like, ooh, yes, I know what this is. I've studied it. I've had members of the general public reach out with very certain ideas about what it is that I don't know if I agree with. <laughs> what, what are some of those ideas? Well, I'll say this is one that has been echoed from other people. But when I first came back, I went to pick up my nephew from kindergarten. He's five. And instead of coming up and giving me a big hug like he normally would, he looks at me and goes, Uncle Sam, we have to talk about this egg. <laughs> like, okay, Alex, let's talk about it. And he goes, I think I know what it is. It's a dragon egg. And so <laughs> that's, that's where I've been getting a lot of the more interesting theories of some sort of mythical creature. Because you don't take the whole thing. How much of it do you take? This one, we did get most of it. Um, they sucked it in. Which yeah, we weird. sucked it in. So first we, we tried to tickle it with the little, because we had no idea what the consistency of it would be. Right. And I think that was almost the most surprising thing about it. I thought it was going to be either hard or squishy, but it was yeah. more flaky than that. And then it had like a harder central portion of it. And I think that's why I'm leaning towards egg case because it kind of had a proteiny layering to it. It almost looked like a croissant <laughs> inside yeah. a little bit. And it had that hole in it that I think part of the commentary between myself and the science leads about our first gut reactions when we saw it, I think are kind of why it took off because we all like X-Files and talking about all that stuff. <laughs> I just hope when we poke it, something doesn't decide to come out. <laughs> it's like the beginning of a horror movie. <laughs> Pretty sure this is how the first episode of the X-Files started. <laughs> if, it's a, if it's an egg, what's it an egg of? That's the question. Yeah. So a lot of marine gastropods, so like your snails, sea snails and stuff like that, make really interesting things. Uh, sometimes if you're walking along the beach, you'll see there's big whelk egg cases that are like curly and long. So they have a lot of different intricate types of egg laying capabilities, <laughs> I guess. I don't really know how to best verbalize that, but um, that would be my first guess. But we just don't know. The specimen is at the Smithsonian now. So that'll get kind of processed through. And with all of the things that we send that way, they get an initial DNA sequencing. So I think that'll give us our first look because right now we don't even know phylum. We don't even know like anything really. So hopefully that'll narrow it down and then we'll get more experts in the field once we have it narrowed down that way to see if we can get it even further. So you take it into the, the ship. When you bring it back up to the big ship, 
is it in an aquarium? Like, does it have to be pressurized? Like, how can you get a look at, at what it is? Like, how, where is it stored? What's it like? So when it's vacuumed into the ROV, it goes into a chamber, the chamber closes, and that's brought back up to the surface. The big thing, I think it was a little surprising to me, and I think a lot of people find it pretty surprising, is that the pressure isn't the main thing that causes things to expire when they come to the surface. It's a difference in temperature that really affects things. So a lot of times we will have things still swimming around when we bring them aboard if it's something that was already swimming around. But then once we have it on board, we take all of our pictures of it. We try to get the pictures as close to life as we can. And then we preserve whatever it is. So depending on the tissue type and, and how we have experts at the Smithsonian that kind of guide us in the best preservation methods, as well as our science leads, we'll re rely on them. So we're always kind of refining that to do it the best. For this and for most things, we preserve it in ethanol because that kind of keep some of the genetic material intact as well, or we'll preserve it in formalin. So it's kind of one or the other, depending on the species. And then once it's preserved, then we'll pack it up and ship it once we get to port. Is somebody from the Smithsonian also watching that live streaming? Are they guiding you, you know, for example, I was a little scared when you were sucking it up because I thought it's going to get destroyed, but you have to do it, I guess. You know what I mean? Like, are they guiding it and then saying, okay, now get it into, keep it in water? Or is that after the fact or before? For a lot of it, from that side of things, it's before. So we like to have an idea of if we see this, then this. But we also rely on the science chat in real time. So we'll talk to the scientists and they'll be like, oh, this is like, for one example, there's a species... It's related to sea stars. It's called a feather star. They're really pretty, but they look like they're attached and they don't look like they can move. And then if you go to grab them, they swim away, which is interesting. But for things like that, we'll have the science chat saying like, Ooh, I tried to collect one of these before you have to use the suction sampler or else they'll kind of swim away on you. For this one, that's kind of why we had no idea what we were dealing with. So we first tried with the grabber to do it and test it that way. And then when we realized that wouldn't work, went for the suction. So in certain circumstances, it's worth figuring it out on the fly and trying one thing, trying another thing. In others, we have a general idea. Like if it's a coral, we can do this with it. If it's a sponge, we do this with it. So it's part of the exploration is figuring out how to best keep these things once we have them. But we have good general guidelines. So that night when you pull this stuff up, did you find it at night or during the day? During the day. So you, when you brought it up, did everybody stand around and look at it and say, hmm, I wonder what this is? Yep. <laughs> I think we were doing the same general head scratching that everybody ashore was doing. I think that's one of the coolest things about my job is that I have full license to say, I don't know, which is something I think in some scientific circles that people are scared of doing. I used to teach before I started working this. And one of the biggest hurdles I would have to get over is telling kids that it's okay to say, I don't know. I have to do it with interns. I have to do it with colleagues. Because one, I think humanizing scientists is important. A lot of people just look at like white trench coat, serious. I'm none of those things. <laughs> but, but that's not what the scientific community really is, right? So I think having some of that human element to it, I think is important. And I think showing humility is a good way to do that. But also we're all kids at heart, I think in the exploration sphere of things. And that kind of tugs at that is that like being able to say like, Ooh, what is this? What could it be? And then you start thinking about all the things that it could be. And it's very exciting. And it reminds me of going into the woods and looking under rocks when I was little, like I kind of never shook that. <laughs> so you bring it up and then the editors cut a film of it and that goes out as the end of day thing. And then how long does it take before this piece of it that nobody's even looking at gets picked up by the newspapers and, and starts to take off? So we had one reporter reach out to us that day or the next day who was watching the live stream, mm -hmm. the guy, Mark Price. And what attracted him to the story initially was kind of the banter between the science leads talking about it. And it's kind of what I was talking about of the human element. It's us saying, I was saying things like, I don't want to be in a room alone with it. <laughs> yeah, right. Which isn't what we mean, but it's kind of fun to play along with that stuff. Uh, right. But then after that, it kind of snowballed. 
So throughout that week, it would be like a radio thing here, there. And then all of a sudden it was like major news stations and it just snowballed from that. I think there's something every year that kind of takes off like that, where it's weird enough and it kind of captures the public imagination, which in my opinion, a lot of times the focus is on the wrong thing, like maybe not the most interesting thing, but there's a huge value in it just for getting people interested in the deep sea, getting people like to start having these conversations about what's down there and getting people's minds going. Like, I think a lot of times we get kind of stuck in our day to day of like, this is how the world is. And I have to follow all this. And then being able to step outside and being like, there's still stuff we have no idea of in our backyard, I think is important. And it kind of broadens your perspective on the world. What is something that you feel like was so unusual? Like you said, this wasn't it, but something you wish the public knew about that was has been discovered? I don't know. For me, especially with this expedition, it was kind of the entirety of it because we went from the Aleutians and then down the seamounts and then into the inside passage and kind of got to see the breadth of Alaska. And that's just Southern Alaska. That doesn't even go into the Bering and, and further North. And just being able to see that I have a special place in my heart for Alaska in general, and just that the kind of wildness and last frontier kind of feeling about land that people know about extends to the oceans as well. But I'll say like the thing that we were all most excited about on board was we came across some octopus that were brooding their eggs. And so the deep sea octopus is where I think a lot of us just love looking at octopus whenever we're on the ship. It's, they're charismatic. They're just so interesting. But seeing them actually brooding the eggs and then learning a little bit more about that sometimes they stay there on their eggs without eating, without moving, just kind of blowing water over it for up to seven years, which is just like unfathomable to me. <laughs> Jeez, I didn't realize it took seven years for an egg to hatch for an octopus. Yeah. And that's hard to know. So the estimates that I've heard are between like four and seven years for some of these species. Oh. It could be longer. It could be shorter. We don't really know what the behaviors are, but seeing that we saw it once early on in the expedition, it was two of them. And you could like zoom in and actually see the tentacles and the eyes of the organisms in the eggs. And we're like, whoa, that's amazing. And we were reeling on that for a couple of weeks. And then our second to last dive we dove on this ridge, probably a hundred miles south of Prince William Sound. So kind of on the shelf before you get to the Aleutian Trench. And we came along this ridge and it was just very picturesque. There were sponges and anemones everywhere. And then everywhere we looked, there was another octopus brooding eggs. So I think we saw between 18 and 20 of them on that one dive. And the really cool thing about that dive was that it appeared they were in kind of different stages. So you'd see like very older looking octopus. And then you'd see like younger, fresher ones. And you could see kind of differences in the eggs too. So after that dive, we actually had scientists ashore reaching out saying that they were already starting to write papers about the discoveries. That was the octopus's garden or the or the hatchery or whatever. That, yeah. That, was the, that story. Yeah. Hatchery, yeah. So I would say as far as like the most interesting thing, it just depends on who you ask. So you ask somebody who likes cephalopods like octopus and squid, they're going to say that. If you ask somebody that likes corals, we found a couple new species that are new to science that we already know are new to science. And then there's others that are probably new. If you ask our echinoderm people, so like your sea stars, we found one that's probably a new genus. So not even a new species. Right. It's a level above that. So just a lot of super exciting things. But kind of like I said before, I think the biggest thing that I try to push more publicly is just that it's all weird. It's all interesting and we need to do more of it. You know, at night when you're on the ship and, you know, you're finding these weird things, you know, and you're obviously an X-Files fan. Do you ever get like a little creeped out? Like you see somebody on the edge of the ship and it seems like a bat landed and it turned it into a person and you don't recognize the person, that kind of stuff. I haven't gotten that far, but I'm big on kind of laying out on the deck and looking up at the stars and kind of thinking about those things late at night. Because especially with the high pace of the ROV dives and everything that's going on, it's a cool way to kind of decompress and think more about the world and everything. But I will say that ship dreams are definitely a thing. So like being in your little bunk, that's all kind of dark. And while you're moving around, you definitely have some, the imaginations run wild. It's fun to think about. How long do you stay out there for, you know, at a time? 
It's usually between like 20 and 30 days. So it's pretty significant. This one was supposed to be 25. We ended up coming in two days early because the weather was just unavoidably bad. You know, what kinds of people are attracted to doing this kind of work? You know, obviously critical thinking is important, but beyond that, you know, when you look at your colleagues, you know, it's a big sacrifice to go out on a ship for 25 days and then look for these sort of very specific things, you know? Absolutely. And that's one of the more rewarding things about this job is that there isn't a stereotype of the person on board and being kind of, for lack of a better term, trapped um, with 48 other people that come from all different backgrounds, all different walks of life. One of the coolest things about it is that you form really close bonds very quickly with people that you would never interact with otherwise. And I think there's a lot of value in that that's not often talked about is just kind of learning those communication skills of like how to interact with people in in positive ways and stressful environments. But as far as the type of person, it definitely takes somebody that's driven to explore and that's okay. There are certain sacrifices, but I think it's super worth it. But even in the role that I do, so my degree is from a community college. I got a, a technician degree and then I weaseled my way into different positions and worked my way here. Some of the people that I work with took a more academic route and have doctorates in biology or geology. So it's kind of like a, a wide range of people. And then one of the nice things about what we do is that we have people that are very technically focused. So people with like a strong acoustics background, that's where my main background is, is in sonars and acoustics. You have people that are biologically focused. And then you also have people that are into marine technology. So the engineers that are building the vehicles and operating the vehicles. And then the more artistic types. So people that are running kind of social media accounts, people that are making these videos and editing them. So that's what's really great about the ocean exploration field is that it kind of takes everybody. And there are ways to contribute if calculus isn't fun for you. It wasn't super fun for me, but it's not prohibitive. And there's Mm -hmm. ways that you can kind of get involved in meaningful ways without taking that route, which isn't for everybody. Yeah. So the, I don't even know what we're calling this object, but now it's at the Smithsonian. Do you know the people who are going to study it there? And when we get to the end of this journey there, what do you think they're going to tell us? I have no idea what they're going to tell us, (laughs) but I think letting the mystery linger a little bit longer is kind of fun, but it'll be initially processed by people working at the Smithsonian that'll do that DNA barcoding and kind of get it all squared away. But after that, the National Museum of Natural History kind of works like a library where scientists anywhere can either check it out so they can request it to be loaned to them to study in their labs, or they can come to the museum and they can use all the -the state-of-the-art equipment there to do any testing that they want. So I would say as far as who's going to do that, I think that would likely depend on what comes of the initial DNA barcoding and where we can see kind of where it will fall within what group and then the specialists in that field who are interested in, I think will descend upon it. What are people <laughs> guessing the most? Yeah. And yeah, I was going to ask the same thing. Are they having like contests, you know? Yeah, I, I'm i team egg case. So I, th- I think that and sponge are probably the two leading ideas right now, but I wouldn't be surprised to be surprised. So I think it, it could be anything really, which is it's pretty alien, alien. alien. <laughs> above. Some it's all alien yeah. us down there, right? But yeah, so I think once we get some of those tissue samples processed, we'll have a better idea of what it is, but. We'll see. We'll come back to find out. Amazing. Well, thank you for coming on and telling us about this. It's great. When do you go back to the sea? I don't go back until probably April or May. So I have some time on land and that'll be to Hawaii. So I'm very disappointed. Oh, sorry. (laughs) Sorry for you. (laughs) For me. Thank you so much. It was great to meet you.